All right. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. This is the second week of our, of our series called Weird. We talked about two weeks ago about how normal isn't working. We talked about how broad is the way and broad is the gate that leads to destruction and many go in by it. We talked about how everybody or all the normal people or the masses are all going through the wide gate which leads to destruction. But Christ tells us, enter through the narrow gate and enter into it because in it you will find life. There's another, narrow, there's another road that's narrow. And the good news is, is that it leads to life, like I just said. And I said this last week, that I used to find comfort in being with the crowd. I wanted to be just like everybody else, and I think all of us went through this phase growing up where we just wanted to be like everyone else. Everyone is going this way, then it's got to be the right way to go. When you have the courage as a believer, to go down the narrow path, I promise you, if you leave that road that leads to destruction, people are going to look at you in a different way. Not necessarily bad. Not necessarily bad. A lot of them are going to say you're weird and you're strange because you're not like everybody else, but they're going to find comfort in the fact that you're weird because normal isn't working for anyone. We talked about this last week. What's normal? Normal is broke. Normal in America is divorce. Normal is broken relationships. Normal is emptiness and depression. That's normal here in America. And I think it's time that we as God's people say, we're not going to be normal. We want to be different. The key thought for this series is, if you want what normal people have, do what normal people do. And if you want what few people have, do what few people do. It's very few people that you find that have peace, and joy, a sense of security, that have courage, that are able to go against any trial, that find joy in trials. Very few that you're going to find like that. Be honest with yourself. How many of you remember, who grew up like at the end of the 80s, early 90s? Do you guys remember MC Hammer Pants? MC Hammer Pants. There was a time where for you... Young people who don't know, there was pants that each pant leg was like this. And like it was the thing to wear. If you had MC Hammer pants, you were the coolest. There was also like cross colors. You guys remember cross colors? People wearing like bright green and red and funny outfits. And that was like the moda. And that was like the normal thing. And be honest. How many of you came to your parents? You said, Mom, Dad, I really need a pair of MC Hammer pants. And they said, no, I'm not going to give it to you, and we're not like them. But they said, Mom, everyone is wearing it. And our parents told us what? It's okay to be different. There's wisdom in that. Imagine if each and every one of you were still wearing MC Hammer pants. How messed up, how messed up people would we look like? Right? MC Hammer pants like this. Normal doesn't work. Normal doesn't last. It's okay to be different. But even more than that, it's way better to be different. When you're led by the Spirit of God, it's way better to be different. Normal people are going to call you weird, but it's okay. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 15 to 16 says, But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Because it is written, Be holy, for I am holy. What did God tell us to be? Holy. Because I am holy. Now, I remember growing up thinking of holy as what used to come to mind was like monastics, monks, nuns, priests, until I became one. And I realized that's not the full truth. But God is calling each and every one of us to be holy. And I know that word can be intimidating. But it's deeper than just being like a nun and a monk and sorry and thank you and all these fake words. That's not holiness. 
Holiness means, in the Greek we know it's agios or hagios. It means to be pure or to be set apart. It literally means to be different. How many holy people do you know? How many holy people do you know? And I'm not talking about in the world, in the church. Is it normal for people to be holy? Is it typical when you look everywhere in the church, in the Sunday school programs, in everywhere you go in the church, is it typical that you find people are holy? God says that in this very impure world, you be pure, because I'm pure. You be like me. Your nature should be like my nature. You're partakers of the divine nature. And I'm going to talk about somebody today They didn't understand the concept of being holy. Our problem as Christians today is not a new one. We're ignoring the fact that we were called to be holy and to be great. And he's saying, I'm calling each and every one of you to be holy. And when I put my spirit in you, and I poured my spirit inside of you, my intention was not that you'd be like everybody else but that you would be the light of the world, that you would be the example, that you would be the shining light in a place where men love darkness. I want to talk to you a little bit about a man named Samson. We know that Samson, when he was born, he was a Nazarite. And there was three things that a Nazarite could not do. We know that Samson, when he was born, he was given a special strength, and that strength was in his hair, right? But a Nazarite was supposed to be holy, and there was three things they could not do. They could not drink any alcohol. They could not touch anything dead or any unclean animal or anything unclean. And they could not shave their heads. They could not cut their hair. All of you guys have heard the story of Samson and Delilah. He fell in love with a woman named Delilah, who was not from the people of Israel. And she was... Not of the people of God, but yet he fell in love with her. He fell in love with her, and the Philistines used Delilah to find out what's the secret behind Samson's strength. God intended that Samson was going to be the deliverer of Israel. He was the one that was going to be in him all the strength. But let me tell you what he did. In Judges chapter 16, verse 7 to 9. First she asked Samson, tell me, what's the secret behind your strength? Give me the secret. And Samson said to her, if they bind me with seven fresh bowstrings, not yet dried, then I shall become weak and be like any other man. So the lords of the Philistines brought up to her seven fresh bowstrings, not yet dried, and she bound him with them. Now men were lying in wait, staying with her in the room. And she said to him, the Philistines are, Philistines are upon you, Samson. But he broke the bowstrings as a strand of yarn breaks when it touches fire. So the secret of his strength was not known. I'm saying, okay, what does that mean? Bowstrings were these cords made of camel hide. And so for Samson to be toying with his consecration as a Nazarite, he's saying, tie me down with camel hide, which is unclean, which he's not supposed to be touched with. And he's playing around with his consecration. Goes on further. Judges 16, 13 to 15, Delilah said to Samson, until now you have mocked me and told me lies. Tell me what you may be bound with. And he said to her, if you weave the seven locks of my head into the web of the loom, so she wove it tightly with the Batten of the loom, and said to him, The Philistines are upon you, Samson. But he awoke from his sleep and pulled out the batten and the web from the loom. Then she said to him, How can you say I love you when your heart is not with me? You have mocked me these three times and have not told me where your great strength lies. You're right, he didn't tell her. But what did he let her do? He let her tie things in his hair. What God considered holy and what God considered the secret of his strength, the secret of him being different, of having a strength that nobody else had, he let a woman play with it. 
how many of us, uh, how many of us as Christians understand that you are called to be set apart, that each and every one of you is meant to be a Samson, that that great strength would be lying in you if you lived differently, if you lived a holy life. But what do we do? We play with our vow of holiness. We play with our consecration to God. We, pray with, we play with our commitment to Him, thinking, I just want to be like everybody else. I don't want to be a fanatic, right? I don't want to be a Jesus freak, right? Because it's weird. It's weird to be all about Jesus. That's what the world tells us. How many of you are playing with your holiness? Imagine God took the Holy Spirit, who is God himself, and said, I'm going to put my spirit where? Where is it going to go, Lord? Where is this precious place? In a sanctuary? No. Sanctuary is Old Testament. I have a new idea. I'm going to put my spirit in my people. And my people are going to be set apart because God is going to be inside of them. How many of us are like Samson? We do what Samson does. We just say, come on. I'm not a monk. I'm not a nun. I'm not a priest. I'm not this. I'm not that. I'm not a missionary. I'm just a normal person. And you're tamping. You're tampering with your consecration because God consecrated you. Consecration isn't wearing a black dress. Consecration happened on the day when you were sealed with Mayroon. You were consecrated. Your temple was sanctified and you were set apart. You were different. But we're playing with it. We take our devotion lightly. We say, what's the big deal? What's the big deal when there's a little bit of gray areas in my life? That's normal. Normal isn't working. I wonder how Samson felt when they jumped on him and they finally could ca capture him and he couldn't get rid of the enemy. He couldn't just break through the soldiers and say, I am Samson of great strength. He couldn't say it anymore. Because he played with his holiness. He played with his devotion as a child, as a deliverer of God. He was supposed to be God's servant. He was supposed to be different, supernatural. The definition for the word weird actually means supernatural. Look it up in the dictionary. It means supernatural. You are meant to be supernatural, but to the world, they hate it. They hate supernatural. They hate holy. They hate different. They want you to be just like them. Here's the key for those who are seriously following Christ. When you're not just a Christian by name, but you truly want to give honor to God in the way that you live. When you follow his teachings, Jesus is going to lead you off the broad path. It's impossible to be walking like everybody else and be following the teachings of Jesus. The teachings of Jesus. Impossible. No way. Come and debate with me. If you can find some person that is living like everybody else and is following the teachings of Jesus. The goal, is not weird. the goal is not weird for weird's sake. But the goal is to please God. The goal is to make him happy. To walk in his footsteps. Nothing makes me happier than when I see my kid doing what he sees me doing. You know, Daniel and Timmy, they like to take my necklace and they walk around the house and they like pretend it's a shoria. And they want to be just like daddy. They want to be like me. They want to be different. There's no greater pleasure to the father than when he sees his children following in his footsteps, being different. But when you leave the path from the broad way, people are going to make fun of you. I'm going to read you something from the Psalms of David in, in Psalm 69. People are going to say, where are you going? Stay here with us. Stay where all the normal people are. Don't be different. Don't be weird. You used to be cool. Stay with us. You used to be fun to hang out with. What's wrong with you? Listen to what David said in Psalm 69, verse 9 to 12. Because zeal for your house has eaten me up, and the reproaches of those who reproach you have fallen on me. He's saying, God, passion for your house has consumed me. Zeal for your house has eaten me up. Passion for what things matter to you 
That's what David had. He had passion for the things that matter to God. And that's what matters to me. And he says, it consumes me. And then he goes on to say, and the insults of those who insult you, God, have fallen on me. And the reproaches of those who reproach you have fallen on me. I'm so much on your side, Lord. I'm so much behind you that when people shoot arrows at you, they're shooting them at me. Because I'm different. It's a rule of life. David is saying it. If you're walking with God, if your passion is for what pleases God or what honors God, he's saying, and the approaches of those who approach you will fall on me. That's a rule of life. In other words, he goes on to say in verse 10, when I wept and chastened my soul with fasting, and David did this a lot, okay, that became my reproach. That became my reproach. What do the people do? What do they do? They make fun of me when I'm different. And I, and I always tell this to parents when I go visit their houses and I tell them, you know, do you read your Bible with your kids? And do they say, Abuna, we're busy. Abuna, life is so busy here. Life here is, 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 is not easy and we're all tired. I said, okay, that's fine. But don't come to me in 15 years from now. When you're saying, Abuna, my kid doesn't love the church. My kid doesn't like to fast. Why? Because the whole world has been telling them since the day they were born, be normal. Be like everybody else. Why should you fast? Why should you pray? Why should you spend your time in meetings at church? Why should you give up your free time to serve God? Why? That's the pressures of the world. He says what? He says, I also made sackcloth my garment. I became a byword to them. Those who sit in the gate speak against me, and I am the song of the drunkards. He's saying, I'm the favorite top topic of the town gossip, and all of the drunks sing about me because I'm so strange. Because zeal for your house has eaten me up. All I want to do is be with you. All I want to do is please you. It made me crazy, Lord. I don't know what to do. But now people are reproaching me. When you leave the broad road and you follow Christ on the narrow road, people are going to mock you. They're going to call you weird. Whatever you do, don't get stuck in the bucket. I'm going to explain what that means. How many of you have ever purchased a bunch of live crabs, took them home, and either you or your parents were going to boil them? You get them and you stick them in a bucket, and this is what it looks like. Sorry? This one. <laughs> and this is what it looks like. It looks like a bunch of crabs who are stuck in a bucket, trying to get out of the bucket. And what do the other crabs do? They grab one crab by the other bottom of the crab. They grab him by his little bottom, and they pull him right back down. And then he tries to climb up to get out of the bucket. And what happens? Pulls you right back down. Don't get stuck in the bucket. Don't get stuck in the bucket. People around you are searching for excuses to justify their lives of compromise. The whole world is living lives of compromise. Purity is nowhere to be found. Purity is nowhere to be found. And it's a sad thing. And everybody's saying, come on, stay here with us. And there's this gravitational pull that is sucking you down to be like the rest of the world in your business practices, in everything that you do. Don't get stuck in the bucket. Many of you are growing in your passion for Christ. You really want to please Him. His Word is making you different. You're trying to be set apart. You're doing your best. And I commend you. For the rest of your life, understand that you're going to deal with the constant pressure to conform to the norm. There's two different types of pressure. And the first one is inward pressure. And that inward pressure is the need to please. We want to make others happy. We don't want anyone to think that we're weird. And if I were really being weird, weird and I was re if I was really being honest, and I'm going to be honest with you, the need to please is one of the biggest challenges in my life. It's one of the biggest obstacles in my life, and it's the need to please. Standing up here today, it's no longer preaching the gospel. It's who can entertain better. Who can make people impressed and who can please others I'm being honest with you this is a pressure 
that you face and this is a pressure that I face. Whenever I feel like God is leading me to do something, the very first thought that drops into my mind is, what are the people going to think? What are their opinions going to be of me? What are my friends going to say? Am I going to get made fun of? Are they going to understand that I just want to be different? Are people going to understand that I'm unique in my own way? Are we proud of being unique? Scripture ad addresses this problem so clearly. In Proverbs 29, 25, the fear of man brings a snare, but whoever trusts in the Lord shall be safe. The fear of man will prove to be a what? It's a snare. The fear of others and the fear of, of, of wanting to please others, it's a trap. It's a trap from the devil. And he draws us into this trap every day. I want you to think just in this week. Think just this week. What decisions did you make based on pleasing others? Pleasing others. Recently, my wife was telling me, like, so finally, I had, a, like, some time off or just a little bit of a break. And she's like, this person wants to come over. I'm like, what? She's like, I didn't want to make them upset. I'm like, we haven't seen each other for like a week. We can't do this. We can't live in fear of wanting to please others. We're different. It's okay. We don't have to please everybody. We've got to set boundaries. This need to please eats up so many people. Imagine if Noah, imagine if Noah had the need to please others. God says, how many of you guys ever saw Evan Almighty? Best movie in the world. Best movie in the world. Imagine if Noah had this need inside of him to please others. And people are saying, God says, go build an ark, there's going to be a flood. And he says, all right, guys, people, guess what? There's going to be a flood, and the world is going to come to an end, and all these things. And people say, come on, enjoy your life. Eat, drink, and be merry. Just stay with us. Hang out a little bit. Imagine if Noah would have lived to please. None of us would be here. None of us would be here if Noah cared so much, if he lived in order to please others. I want to talk about a Hebrew word named, or called mokesh. The word is the word for trap or snare, but the literal meaning is to describe a ring put in an animal's nose. So what happens is, in order to control a bull, it all happens just by putting a ring in a bull's nose. And they stick a rope in it. And this bucking bull, all you got to do is just pull that rope a little bit. And all of a sudden, you can draw that bull into a trap because that bull is so sensitive to that pull. And there are so many people pulling on you. That trap is like somebody tying a ring in your nose and pulling a rope in it and pulling at it. Imagine how easy it is to follow that because it's painful. Because you have this need to please. Fear of man will prove to be like a hook in your nose. Maybe God will lead you to do something, but the fear of people's opinions will cause you to wonder what people are going to think of you. So what happens? Maybe it's for the ladies. Maybe you want to dress conservative and pure, but nobody does. Nobody does, and, and you feel like, I can't find any clothes like that anymore. There was a time where, in my service, I'm, we were addressing this issue, and they are saying, Abuna, or, or you have to go and see the stores. There's no clothes like that anymore. There's no clothes. You can't find any conservative clothes. Look harder. Look harder, okay? Go somewhere else, move to another, do something. But all of a sudden, you're being pulled to do things that you wish you could do, but you can't do it. So many of you are not doing what God has called you to do because you're afraid of what people are going to think. Never forget this. Becoming obsessed with what people think about you is the quickest way to forget what God thinks about you. Imagine. Every day, all you think about is what everyone around thinks about you. And all of a sudden, you haven't thought for such a long time, what does God think of me? Is God proud of me? 
Does God want to tell me, good job? Does God want to say, bravo, Alik, you're different, you're weird? Or is God going to say, broad gate, wide gate, leading to destruction? I'm afraid that so many of us aren't able to do what God wants us to do because of that. St. Paul was amazing. He said this verse in Galatians. He says, if I still pleased men, I would not be a bondservant of Christ. And you have to make a decision tonight, today. Are you going to be a bondservant of Christ or are you going to please men? He says, if I still please men, I can't please Christ. I can't be his servant. The two are contrary to one another. He says elsewhere in Romans chapter 6, verse 16, Do you not know that to whom you present yourselves slaves to obey, you are that one slaves whom you obey, whether of sin leading to death or of obedience leading to righteousness? Who are you a slave of? Who do you present yourself a slave of to every day? Is it your society? Is it your friends? Is it those people around you? The opinions of others? The opinions of the world? Go ahead. But you're their slave. And that slavery leads to sin and death. The person that wakes up every morning and says, Lord, I present myself a slave to you in your righteousness. You are that person's slave. You are God's, serv you are God's slave. You are God's servant, and he will honor you. You see, St. Paul knew these things. That's why St. Paul had no problem saying, you are rich, and we are poor. He says, we are fools for Christ's sake. Imagine, he said it with such pride. We are fools for Christ's sake. Are you a fool for Christ? Are you a fool for Christ in the eyes of the world? I'm afraid we don't have enough of those. We don't, I'll go to a meeting, okay. I'll attend church, okay. I'll do this, or I'll do that, okay. But be a fool? No way. No way. St. Paul says he's proud to be a fool for Christ's sake. How about with your family? How great would it be if families just started making changes? What are normal things to do? Like Christmas, for example. Imagine if you made Christmas about being something even better. What's normal for Christmas? Gifts and giving to me and what am I going to get and sales and 24-7 in the malls and following all the website deals and all this stuff. That's normal for the nativity of Christ. That's normal. What if family said, this year we are different. We're not like the world. All that money, and be honest with yourselves. Even if you're broke, be honest with yourself. You're broke. How much money do you spend on Christmas for gifts and stuff like that? Four or five hundred dollars? That's conservative. These are the broke people spending four or five hundred dollars on gifts for either me or people that I want to please. What if we, as families and as individuals, that we said, our family is going to be different this year. Every money, we, every dollar we were going to put towards something to please somebody else in the world, we're going to take it and give it to the poor. Every, I don't know, whatever new cup Starbucks has that comes out, every cup that I decide I'm going to buy of that, I'm going to give it to the poor. I'm going to give it to the kingdom of God. I'm going to send it to a missionary. I wish, I wish families would start building a strong sense of family identity. Saying we're unique. I read a quote. It said, wherever family identity is strong, peer pressure is going to be weak. Wherever family identity is strong, peer pressure is going to be weak. But wherever family identity is weak, which is normal, peer pressure is going to be strong. If you are sucked into this, if your kids are sucked into this, peer pressure and all these things, you want to know what the secret is? Give yourself, your family a strong sense of identity. We're different. These are what the Griswolds do. The Griswolds do this, and that's what we do. We're a weird family, and you're going to accept it, and you're going to love it. And sometimes, you know, when I talk to some of you guys, you tell me about the weird things your families do, and I love it. And I love the fact that you guys do weird things together, because that makes your family special. You don't give in to all the hasa of the world. We have to deal with this inward need to please. Fear of man, it will prove to be a snare, but whoever trusts in the Lord will be safe. Then there's the outward pressure, and that's criticism. That's criticism. They're going to hurl insults at you, and they're going to try to 
make fun of you or, or criticize you for being set apart. It's going to sound like this. Why not cheat on your taxes? Do you know where your money's going to the government? Do you know where they're dumping your money? Save yourself some money. Stop being like weird. Cheat on your taxes, save some money, and everyone will be happy. The government can you know, burn somebody else's money, right? And this is criticism. Why are you doing this? Why are you going to go to another meeting at church? Cafe, enough. It doesn't make sense what you're doing. Enjoy life a little bit. Doesn't God want you to be happy? Doesn't God want you? You're just wasting your time. You're wasting your time. And we hear the criticism from others day in, day, day in and day out. John 15, 18, Christ says, If the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. Look at that. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. Yeah, because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will keep yours also. You can never please anyone. Normal people don't like it when we try to be different. People complain if you try to save money and live a conservative life. They say, what are you doing? God's giving you money, enjoy it. And they criticize you. And then all of a sudden, you live lavishly and you do this. They say, oh, you should have given to the poor. And that's exactly what happened to Christ. Christ was always having compassion. And this and that. Finally, when the lady came to offer the spices for his burial, they said, why wasn't the stuff given to the poor? I've been giving to the poor for the last three years. It's just one thing done for my burial. Jesus could never please anybody. He was always being criticized. Pharisees... Never had a good thing to say about him. People within the church criticize. You guys are always complaining about how we need money. Close down the school. Close down the school. We'll have so much more money in the church if you close down the school. No. We've made a decision to be a different church. To be a church with a mission. To be a church building up the next generation. What about Orthodox sermons? You've got thousands of people listening to Orthodox sermons. Why don't you charge for the sermons? Be wise, guys. And we chose to make Orthodox sermons free so that thousands and tens of thousands could hear the Word of God, criticism upon criticism. Christ says, rejoice in being persecuted. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Theirs is what? So what about the people that are not persecuted? I don't know. But I'm going to let you use your imagination. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil, evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven. We have to be heaven bound. If you're living on earth, and you're content with being on earth, be normal. But if you want to be different, you want to be set apart and holy and weird, know that criticism is going to come. But when it comes, rejoice. I'm going to close right now. Gideon. Gideon is amazing. You know, Gideon was a small guy, young guy. One day, the Midianites were, they were stealing all the stuff of the Israelites and God called Gideon and said, you're going to be my deliverer. You're going to de deliver the people of Israel. And Gideon said, I'm like the youngest of my father's house and we're the smallest clan of all of Israel. Why me? He said, I'm going to be with you and I'm going to bless you. Then he said, but first, before you go, you have to go and you have to break down your father's idols and build for me an altar. And it says he did it in the night because he was afraid of people's criticism. He was afraid. And he built, he took the wood, and he offered a sacrifice to God, the wood that was used to build an idol for Baal. And then they woke up in the morning, and they saw this was done to the altar, and they said to his father, they said, your son did this. What should we do? We should kill him. And the father, he didn't care about their criticism. He said, if you care about your people and all this stuff, 
kill your son. He said, if you believe in this God, let him defend himself. If you believe in Baal, let him defend himself. Of course, it was just stones and junk. And then he called his son the challenger of idols. I wish we would be the challengers of criticism. I wish we would be like Gideon, that we like, like criticism eggs us on. It makes me want to do more for the kingdom of God. That I wish my name would be the challenger of the idols of this world. That I wouldn't deal with the pressure. I wish we could be like Gideon. I wish we could be like him and say, I'm no longer going to deal with the pressures from the inside or the out of criticism or the need to please. My life is to please God and to be holy and to glorify Him in everything I do because weird is better. Weird is better and normal is weak and worse. And glory be to God forever. Amen. Let's stand up and pray. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. Our Master and Savior, Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you, Lord, that you've given us examples to show us, Lord, that being different is better and being set apart, Lord, is, is what you've called us to do, Lord. You've called us to be holy. You've called us to be different, Lord. You've called us to be pure in an impure world. I pray, Lord, that as you've consecrated us and you've made us your own and you've made us holy, Lord, that we wouldn't play with our, our, our consecration to you, that we wouldn't just tamper with the things that will cause us to lose our strength in you, Lord. It will cause us to lose our holiness. It will cause us, Lord, to no longer bring pleasure to your heart, Lord. Set us apart for you, Lord. Grant that each and every one of us would be the challenger of idols. That we could say with St. Paul, if I still pleased men, I would not be a bondservant of Jesus Christ. We want to be your servants. We present ourselves as your servants, different from the world, set apart, longing, Lord, to bring you glory because zeal for your house has eaten us up, Lord. We don't care, Lord, what the world says because we want to set our part, ourselves apart for you and for your pleasure. We pray this in your holy and precious name through the intercessions of the Holy Virgin Mary and the prayers of St. Mark. Make us worthy to pray thankfully our Father who art in heaven. Now the love of God the Father, grace of his only begotten Son, our Lord, God and Savior, Jesus Christ, the gift and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. Go in peace. The peace of the Lord be with you all. Real quick announcement.